So I think that as teachers who want to help our students enjoy learning and learn as effectively as possible, we want to try to capitalize on those intrinsic relevancies. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Pudua, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Chief Marketing Officer. As we take a break from recording, we have chosen to replace several of our greatest hits for you to enjoy. We hope that you are able to gain insight for your educational journey. Well, Andrew, the months are clipping along. Here we are in November. November. Is there anything special about November? We actually consulted the calendar before we hit record and found a few interesting topics that we could discuss, none of which we're actually going to discuss because they're not relevant. Oh, well, it's always nice to know what could have been. We could have talked about National Historic Bridges Awareness Month. Historic Bridges Awareness Month. Yes, and... I find this fascinating just because I have, as you know, a bridge phobia. So if the bridges are too high, I don't oh. want to go over it. So well, you I would, probably like those covered bridges. I, I do. Because you can't see. It's like more like being in a tunnel than on a bridge. Exactly. I, yeah. I'm like those horses. If you put blinders on me, I'm happy. Well, they probably covered the bridge so the snow wouldn't make it so slick and mm. they wouldn't slip and slide off the bridge. Could be. It's also No Shave November. So, I know. I, that happens around here a lot. <laughs> All these guys just start looking so scruffy. You know. <laughs> right. All right. We can live through. This is National Role Models Month. National Role Models Month. Yes. So you think about your role model, someone that you want to be when you grow up, and you, I suppose, write them a thank you letter or something. I think that would be a good thing. Oh. Yeah. We could We could play on that a little we bit. We could play on that yeah. a little bit, yes. I, ironically, it's also National Roasting Month. Now, we haven't decided that that's roasting coffee or roasting people, as in Or maybe roasting fun of meat. Or maybe roasting meat could be. Yeah. yeah so it's National Roasting Or meat. maybe all roasting. So <laughs> it is National Write a Novel in a Month, NaNoWriMo. Yes. Some of our favorite student writers who learned to write with IEW and have now, are now published authors. So let's say you wanted to start a National Motivation Study Month. Hmm. How do you do that? Who do you talk to to get your month nationalized? I have no idea. <laughs> we should research that. Yeah. We'll get, okay. our, we'll hey, get our stuff We could have a National How to Get Your Month Recognized Month. month. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, our topic for today and perhaps the next couple weeks is a subset of what you talked about in one of your most beloved convention talks, teaching boys and other children who would rather make forts all day. And that topic is the forms of relevancy. Relevancy, yes. So I noticed early on in my life of teaching and learning that if something is meaningful, applicable, useful, interesting, relevant, then it's easier to learn, Mm -hmm. right? Sure. And if something is not interesting, meaningful, applicable, useful, relevant, somehow it's harder to learn. And this is true for all of us, whether we're children or adults. If if you have an interest in something, yeah, the information is going to stick. Yes. And you're going to remember it and be able to apply it, and there's going to be reinforcement, and you will come to know and learn that. If it's just something that someone wants you to learn, Mm -hmm. to hold in your brain for a short period of time, just so someone can say you learned it, well, you may be able to do it, but there's not that same stickiness. Right. Right. So this kind of intangible quality that makes learning easier, I chose to call relevance. Great. So I looked up in the dictionary what relevance actually means. Okay. It means the condition of being relevant. (laughs) 
Okay, that's terribly useful. <laughs> yes. Or connected with the matter at hand. Okay. So when I think about connected relevancy, connected with the matter at hand, and looking at all of these possible November themes that we could discuss today, none of them seemed relevant to <laughs> relevancy. <laughs> so we're going to talk then about the forms of relevancy. Yes. Because I have, uh, over the decades, identified and come to understand, I think, at least four distinct different forms of relevancy. Okay. So we'll start with the best. Okay. And, and most effective and work down to the least. Okay. What's the first form of relevancy? Well, I call it intrinsic hmm. relevancy. So it, that's something that's just in you. There doesn't even have to be an explanation of why. It's just something maybe you were born with mm. or it got into your mind, heart, imagination somehow, and you just are interested in it. Mm -hmm. You can't necessarily trace a cause, mm -hmm. but it's there. And it's often very strong. Can you think of any things like that when you were a child that were just there? You just were interested for no other reason than that you were. I can't, off the top of my head, come up with something of my own, but I can think of my son, who was ADHD. We had a hard time getting him to sit still for just about anything, except for jigsaw puzzles. He loved putting together jigsaw puzzles and would literally sit for hours putting them together. So he would sit for hours to do a jigsaw puzzle, but not sit for hours to do math Any, or spelling or... <laughs> right. Anything else that was apparently irrelevant to him. Huh. Maybe I should have gotten math facts jigsaw puzzle. That I was just help. thinking that. <laughs> Maybe there's a, a whole product now in educational <laughs> jigsaw puzzles. I'm not sure, but... Never well, that's interesting. That so, so he was highly motivated mm -hmm. to do those puzzles. Yes. Another person might not be. No. Um, I, for example, found them quite tedious and frustrating. Uh, I would lose any interest after a short period of time and... That wouldn't have at all been so. So that's just a difference right. in personality, right. just core. Uh, for me, probably I look at my childhood and for some reason, which I do not know, my mother said that I was begging for a violin from the time I could talk. Interesting. So she was a voice and piano teacher. So mm -hmm. I grew up in a musical environment and I guess I went to orchestras. But I had no interest in playing the piano and a tremendous desire to play the violin. Hmm. Why? Yeah. I, I can say in retrospect that I'm quite certain I wouldn't be sitting here with you today. The Institute for Excellence in Writing wouldn't exist. My entire life would be different if I had not grown up playing the violin. Right. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I was never really all that good. Hmm. I mean, not top, top good good enough to teach, and I don't teach anymore, I don't play anymore, but the bearing that that had on my destiny is really quite remarkable. So there there was something deep in my soul. Some Somehow there was this drive to play the violin that was an essential point in the road uh, for my whole destiny right. and, and all the things that exist because of that. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful to my mother who is willing to cater to that, to say, okay, he wants a violin, we'll find him a violin teacher and we'll do this. And so I grew up playing the violin. I think there's some relevancies that we see that are sometimes even based on boys and girls. Sure. I mean, I think if you were to go out and kind of pull random 10, 11 year old boys and find out what interests them, there would be some kind of universal things weaponry, tools, cars, machines. You know, I have a, a grandson who at two, at two years old, was all he wanted to do was learn about machines, big, mighty machines, bulldozers and yes. excavate. He knew, he knew the word backhoe at two years old, right. you know, <laughs> and dump trucks. And, you know, why? Mm -hmm. Why? Where did that come from? It certainly wasn't his mother's fascination. It wasn't his father's fascination, but it's in his soul part of who he is mm -hmm. so we see these things so i think when we when we as as we notice our children have these interests to the degree we can bring learning opportunities to them that are consonant that that 
resonate with their intrinsic relevancies, then learning will happen so much more easily. Right. I always think the example the example of baseball and sports is interesting. I have no interest really in baseball or sports and I suppose I kind of tried to be interested in football once upon a time, but for the most part, I, I don't store information. I couldn't tell you who played in the Super Bowl last year to save my soul. Uh, truth be told, people who are into football may not be able to tell you that either, unless it was their team. <laughs> uh, however, you will meet a boy who will, you know, be very resistant with like schoolwork, mm. right? But knows every batting stat yep. for every major league baseball player on the team that he loves. Yep. And he can learn and memorize and retain, and I guess there's a use for such information. And and that's easy for him because of the super high relevancy. Right. And so asking, is that relevant, you know, to use the word, to his real life, memorizing what may appear to you or me as a pointless fact that still has value in expanding his Ability to memorize, is that not true? I would think so. I mean, knowing stuff is good. And you can never know everything. Right. So the question is then, what shall you know? (laughs) What's worth knowing? Right. And you meet some kids who are just fascinated with, oh, who did I meet? A a lepidopterist. Mm -hmm. A a kid who is fascinated with butterflies and moths. Mm -hmm. And he could show you and name for you the scientific names of all these obscure butterflies and moths. What in the world use is that? Well, I you can impress your friends, I suppose. Yes. <laughs> but there's a joy mm-hmm. for him mm-hmm. in knowing all that. The same way there's a joy for the the baseball aficionado in knowing all of that. And then you, you meet kids who, you know, may get into a particular period of history. Right. And can name every single Civil War general and which battles they fought in and who won and lost and how many casualties there were. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's not information that's particularly useful, mm-hmm. but there's this mastery. And so as a child, when you you have the freedom to kind of go in deep and learn a lot about a thing that's relevant to you, right, then you, you actually learn how to learn. A little better. I wonder if your son who loved puzzles now in his current job finds certain puzzles that need to be solved in the world of IT and video editing and all the other things he does. And so maybe there's a connection in that aptitude and now in his in the the relevancy that helps pay the bills. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you and I both know how relevant that is to our <laughs> lives right now and projects that we're working on and the the good that he brings to our team and being able to be a puzzle put her together a problem solver. Yeah. I did this talk, you know, however imperfectly mm-hmm. and then we we put it in a book and there's a article that summarizes the talk and the DVDs in the back of the book and One of the things I've learned over 30 years of teaching is I really do believe that how children learn something has a more lasting effect than what they learn. Mm. Because we will learn and forget many, many things. The things we forget, if we need those, we can relearn them more easily. But when we have the freedom to really explore and go in depth, that forms our our cognitive function to some degree. It, it forms the way we learn to learn. Mm-hmm. So to the degree that that it's possible in uh, homeschooling, of course, you have a, a quite a bit more freedom perhaps than you do. But if you're teaching in a classroom, you still do have some choices. And you can choose to read this story or that story. You can choose to learn this poem or that poem. You can choose to focus more on this aspect of this part of history or mm-hmm. science or that aspect of that part of history or science. So I think that as teachers who want to help our students enjoy learning and learn as effectively as possible, we want to try to capitalize on those intrinsic relevancies. I think about the conversation we had 
well, just a week or so ago about Unit 4 and how going through the, the order of the structural models, the creative writing, back over to the facts-based writing. I think about the classroom teacher who is faced with both groups of students. Some prefer the creative, some prefer the facts-based. This mm-hmm. is somewhat in in that vein, is it not? I think so, because it's, it's all a matter of choices, mm-hmm. right? So unit four is helping students choose. And if we say to them, well, you choose what you think is interesting, important, or relevant, that's going to be a better learning experience than if we say to them, now you try to figure out what's the most important stuff. Right. Because they may not be, have the tools, the life experience, the common, you know, the general sense of it to know what's more important. And then we would have to kind of say, oh, well, you know, that's interesting, but this is more important. Right. Whereas if they get to, to choose and say, well, I think that's interesting, so that's what I'll put in my in my little report. Okay. You know, hands-on structure and style, hands-off content. So it's intrinsically relevant to them and therefore more likely to last longer. Yep, I think so. I think so. And we also talked a little bit about um, how if you do write something, you will remember it a whole lot more mm-hmm. than if you just read it a few times or even if you read it and talk about it. Right. I mean, almost anything that you have represented in such a... I would use the word tedious, but that might not be. <laughs> but a a careful, conscious, uh, intentional way, when you represent that information with that level of intensity, it's going to stick with you much, right. much more solidly than, like I said, if you just read it a couple times. Right. That's why they say, you know, the best way to learn anything, teach it. Right. You know, next to that or equal to that, write about it. Mm-hmm. Now, unfortunately, we can't always cater to the interests of the child. I was just going to ask that. What if the child is really into music? I have a son who was really into music. He still had to do his math. Was I an evil mother that I forced him to do math and put down the guitar? Well, I don't know. You'd have to ask him. (laughs) I'm sure as an adult, he's grateful for whatever math he's got, Mm -hmm. as we all are. But it, it is that case where there's always going to be a balance, you know. Can we, you know, and I know people who pretty much go on this extreme, what mm-hmm. some some might turn uh, unschooling, mm-hmm. which is just basically let the student learn and study whatever they want to all day long and don't try to interfere with that or dictate that they should do something else. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the opposite of the... You know, the curriculum that has the the subjects and the grade level for each subject and the schedule of what to do every day so that you finish, you know, the textbook for each grade level in each subject. It's kind of the opposite. So I think most people discover the balance, as in many things, mm-hmm. is in, in the middle. But we do have some freedom to capitalize on that intrinsic relevancy. Now, uh, you know, I have for many years uh, been uh, following and sharing some ideas from Dr. Sachs. Yes. And what his work has found is that in a classroom, if you have an all boys class, you are much more likely to hit things that are relevant to boys. Therefore, the learning is better. Hmm. In an all girls class, you're much more able to introduce things that are likely to be more relevant to girls. So you're, you're likely going to have better learning there. So his argument is that you generally will have a better learning environment when you separate boys and girls in schools. Mm-hmm. And he has a lot of interesting examples to that effect. Um, one, I think, hits home with most of us because I don't know if they still do it in schools right now. But when I was in high school, we were forced to read this book, Lord of the Flies. Mm-hmm. Were you forced to read? I was not. You were not. Well, it's kind of a a broken book. Mm -hmm. Like nothing good happens and it just gets worse and worse and worse. And so it's a little bit on the depressing side. And and the value of the book, and why is it a classic? Why have people been reading it for 50, 70 years Mm -hmm. or more? Well, because it shows what happens, you know, when humanity lacks guiding principles and structure and authority and... And, and what happens 
you know, if you just throw a bunch of boys on an island and they operate in an anarchy state, hmm. right? Okay, so he points out that this is a part of the high school literature canon in many places. But if you if you have a conversation with the boys about how they how this book makes them feel, they won't really be very engaged because they don't really feel they can't figure out how they feel. So they'll just say things like, "Well, you know, that was stupid." <laughs> Well, that, okay. So how do, how do you get them engaged in the book? He said the best way to get them to read the book closely is give them the assignment of mapping the island. Mm. Because then they have to read it and in their mind imagine this island and where were all these things and what happened. And they get engaged in that because the relevancies are are more likely to suit. Because boys perhaps – have a tendency more toward maps and understanding where sure. things are placed yeah. geographically. Um, another example he uses is, uh, I love this one, it's it's the Fibonacci sequence and the golden ratio. Okay. So you're probably familiar with this numerical sequence that goes 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21 and it goes on so it's it's adding the previous two numbers okay so zero plus one is one one plus one is two two plus one is three three plus two is five right five plus three is eight eight plus five is 13 13 plus eight is 21 and it's a progression it's sure named after mathematician fibonacci and what's interesting is that if you graph this particular numerical sequence, you get a thing that is called the golden ratio. Mm. And we see this in nature. Yes. Right? So the ancient Greeks designed the angle of their buildings based on this ratio. Right. We see it in, say, a nautilus shell, mm -hmm. right, in that, in that spirally pattern. We also notice that the numbers of petals on flowers – almost always follow this sequence and other manifestations in nature, right? So it's, okay, you want to teach boys about this. You start with the numbers and the graph, and then you show them the thing in nature, right? Mm -hmm. Because one's more relevant than the other, has greater intrinsic relevancy. Whoa, that's really cool. You do this number thing, and you plot it out, and you get this cool shape. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the girls, you start with the nature. Count the petals, look at the pine cone, examine the pineapple, look at the nautilus shell, see that, and then discover that the numerical pattern mm. matches the, the thing. And so he's got all sorts of strategies like this that can help to increase the relevancy. So that's the intrinsic relevance. Intrinsic relevancies, how to capitalize on intrinsic relevancies. You know, so as I say in the in the talk, you know, if you're homeschooling, that's easy. You know, you want to do a unit study or you want to do something and call it science. Mm -hmm. So you think, well, we could study edible plants of North America or the construction of medieval weaponry. It should be a no-brainer. <laughs> edible plants. No. <laughs> <laughs> now, some people would say, oh, well, you should choose edible plants because that's more useful. Right, So if you're out hiking in the Appalachians when you're a little older and you get lost and there's a storm and you know what you could eat or you shouldn't eat, that knowledge might save your life. Yeah. It's more useful. Therefore, you should study that. But I love to cook. So I am definitely more interested in edible plants. Yes, but from a boy's perspective, no one knows <laughs> when how to make a catapult might not come in very useful. <laughs> Especially if you have little brothers. <laughs> You know, also another thing I've seen that has a strong intrinsic interest with boys is um, businesses. Mm. You know, a lot of kids and girls too. I'm not. I'm not trying to say it's exclusively boys, but you know, what do kid? What is kids' job? Mm, to make more work for their parents. No, no, no. no, no honestly, no, okay. what is the what is the full time goal? Of a child. To grow up. To grow up. 
And so that's what they want to do more than anything, right? Right. I mean, as soon as they're four and they know that you could be five, that's what they want to be, <laughs> right. right? Exactly. And, you know, so they want to have a life that is as adult-like as possible mm -hmm. because that's very relevant to them. So that's why I'm often encouraging, you know, uh, families to look at, well, how could I help this child start kind of a little business mm -hmm. or some kind of service project or something that is real in mm -hmm. the real world because of all the relevancies, right, that's what they want. Why do boys want real knives, <laughs> not fake ones, right. right? A fake one is okay until you discover that there is you a real discover <laughs> that you could possibly have a real one. Mm -hmm. I, I've been, you know, very strong in that area of supporting entrepreneurial education. We have our Lemonade, lemonade to Leadership mm -hmm. for the uh, elementary, uh, maybe middle school. And then Carol Topp, mm -hmm. uh, her excellent series, Micro Business for Teens. And it's just so interesting. Uh, I could go on many, many stories. In fact, maybe we do a whole podcast on stories of kids who started businesses and learned all sorts of skills and gained all sorts of knowledge, not because someone made them do it, but because it was it became intrinsically relevant to them as a part of this process of starting a, a business. Great. So we are out of time. Okay. And we got to one form of relevance. One of the four. One of the, the four. first and highest. So the first and highest. The the summary cap on that is Try to find out what are your children's, what are your students' intrinsic relevancies, and as much as you can, capitalize on those. Give the opportunity to maximize learning in the areas of strongest interest. All right. Sounds great. And we'll hit the next one next week. Okay. Talk to you then. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us for one of our favorite episodes. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. Or you can visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcast. New recordings will begin airing in January of 2020. Until then, we hope you'll join us each week as we revisit our greatest hits.